Thank you, Sam, and thank you for giving us uh, an advert uh, to get uh, to ask people to get involved. I think that'd be, that's really great. So thank you very much indeed, and thank you also for being so supportive to us in in uh, in general within the research program. Um, I'm uh, well. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I am Joy Clancy. I am an emeritus professor in energy and gender at the University of Twente, which is in the the Netherlands. Um, I've been asked to uh, chair today's uh, session, well, not chair, to, to moderate uh, today's session. And, uh, but first of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of an explanation about the, uh, the gender and energy research program that comes under the auspices of the, the uses TCP. It has this very grand uh, title, which is empowering all gender in policy and implementation for achieving transitions to sustainable energy. Wow. Right. What does all that mean? So, well, basically, generally, what we are aiming to do, as Sam, as Sam uh, touched on, is, is we're trying to bridge the gap between research and practice of energy policy making. Why in the energy sector is, it, is energy policy still so gender blind? I think that's one of the, the things that we are aiming to try to, uh, to address to, to, to uh, make sure it's no longer gender blind. And I think we can say two things. Well, we still have an um, a energy policy that doesn't take gender into, into account, that it's not good for the energy transition. That's certainly what our research shows. And so that means it's not good for achieving SDG 7. And likewise, if we if we if energy policy is not being both gender inclusive and inclusive and socially inclusive, then it's also not good for uh, achieving SDG five and uh, and the other SDGs. Now, I uh, the. In terms of the research program, we have three challenges. We decide that, I mean, there are a lot more challenges, but our research program is set out to look at three particular things. One, that there is um, a lack of uh, knowledge transfer. Now, the, uh, there is a lot of academic research, particularly in the global south, as relates to gender and uh, gender and energy nexus. But it's not getting into policy. I've just said before that energy policy is, is still continues in, to a large extent to be gender blind. So what um, what we're looking at and is is what how can we address that, this sort of issue? That the that we, we recognise as researchers that the the energy system both the social and technical aspects of it continue to have a dominant norm, which is, tends to be a masculine culture. And I'm going to say a little bit more about that in, in, in a second, but it's the, 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 the sector is seen as one that is primarily employs men and that the consumer is, is viewed as neutral. It's, it, it's, we talk about, well, the word consumer shows no differentiation in terms of social characteristics, even at the, the uh, level of men and women. But men and women have different, different perspectives, different uses. Um, and also these are moderated by other social characteristics. So we, we want to understand why, though, this is not being take, taken up. And the third challenge was about understanding then the, the user's perceptions about technology. And it's particularly now we're going to go much closer to the consumer for production. So the, and uh, so that energy production is increasingly de being decentralized and down to even to as far as the household. And so do, does we, what we really are concerned about, particularly because of women's continued lack of um, 
enthusiasm to engage with technology and particularly because we're moving to technology that is is uh, much more digitalized we're concerned that we may actually be increasing um, uh, gender inequality rather than uh, doing something about uh, ensuring that it's we are moving towards gender equality so can I have the next slide then Mariella so how does this then transform into our research program well, we have a main task, which is to formulate country specific briefs for clean, effective and inclusive energy policy implementation and technological interventions. And that we, the, 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 the leader of the whole research program um, is Anna Arberg from Chalmers University of Technology, which is in, uh, in Sweden. And I, I want to particularly stress about the country specific briefs, because a lot of the, the things that we are examining are very contextual, that they will, they will vary. There's a lot of commonality, but, the, but uh, there's also a lot of specifics. And it's one thing having energy policy that is gender sensitive, it's another thing to uh, implement it. And that's what we are seeing at the moment is some energy policy, particularly I think driven by the SDGs and also uh, the, um, the, the uh, climate change uh, that it's getting stuck. It's getting into policy sometimes, but then nothing happens. So why not? Now there are three subtasks. Um, which link to the challenges. Subtask one is um, has is led by uh, Helena Alborg, also from Chalmers, and she, the, the, that subtask is about uh, pathways uh, to uh, to change, and it's about looking for learning about region about what's happening what's what's can we identify as best practice and particularly to look for context sensitive recommendations so not to be totally generic hence why i was pointing out about the country specific uh, briefs now subtask two um, is about understanding these norms and it's about looking at specifically in, at institutions and about how institutions are um, and why they're not using the research that we academics are uh, slavishly uh, producing. Uh, so it's, tr it's trying to gain an understanding so that we can present uh, policy uh, recommendations in a way that is more acceptable. And that's, um, I, am, I am one of the uh, subtask leaders together with my colleague, Mariella Feinstra, who you will hear in, uh, from more in a moment. And that's why it's uh, subtask two is in bold because that's the, the, the really the central uh, element of today's presentation. Well, having said that, the other two subtasks, we, it's a coordinated uh, um, uh, a program in which each uh, subtask feeds in, supports, and learns and draws from the other other two. The final subtask uh, three is about designing inclusive and efficient technological interventions. And here I want to stress the word inclusive, because it's not only uh, the gender as taking it, taking gender as male, female, then it's also about other other social characteristics such as age, ethnicity, uh, uh, civil status, income. So it's about being inclusive and how to get that complexity of the user into, into policy. And particularly, I think one of the things that we are interested in, I think most of us come from a more social science background, is how to get that rich understanding that we find with using qualitative data into, uh, into convincing the quantitative people that there's something they can learn from, uh, from us. And uh, subtask three at the moment is led by Anna. Um, now you can see that, uh, and Sam mentioned uh, who are the members of the users TCP, specifically involved with the um, with the our research program is Sweden, the Netherlands, Austria, Ireland and the UK, as well as some input at the moment, we're hoping for more from Australia and the US. 
Well, those of you who are uh, astute will have noticed that these are all from the Global North. Well, yes, there's, uh, there's, there's a good reason for that in one sense, is that gender and energy in, in the Global North has tended until now to be very much about women's employment in the energy sector. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's, there's lots of good reasons for, for uh, promoting that. But there's less work done on the differentiation related to the user. And so, uh, so we want to, so that's what we're going to focus on in this research program. However, there is a vast amount of experience in the global south about gender and energy. And all of us who are involved in this research uh, uh, program are very keen to stress that this isn't a northern exclusive uh, club, that we are very much here to, uh, to learn from the south. So having said that, um, I'm, not, we're going to, I'm going to hand you over now to Mariella Feinstra. Um, and uh, I think Mariella can introduce herself. Uh, she's going to give a presentation which links to the uh, our uh, subtask, and then we're going to have a, um, a response to, uh, to her presentation by uh, first of all Anna Rojas, who is a, a long-standing colleague of of mine, who has a lot of experience from the practice side of gender and energy. I think Anna also brings, a, I value Anna for many things, but particularly because she brings in the, the uh, Spanish speaking uh, experience to do with gender and, uh, and energy. She's also done recently a very interesting study on looking at engendered uh, energy policy. Followed by her is Martin Hultmann, who is also from Chalmers, and Martin is part of our research uh, team. And uh, Martin, um, I, I've known not so long as Anna, but I'm certainly very excited uh, and by the work that he's doing because he's bringing masculinities into the, into the, the research domain of gender and energy. So having said that, first of all, that, let me remind you, please put in uh, questions, comments into the, into the Q&A, not into the chat, into the Q&A. Okay, everybody, Anna, um, Mariella, good to go? Yes, I am. So thank you very much for introducing Joy and uh, looking forward to uh, discuss uh, with all of you and especially uh, with the discussants about my ongoing research on uh, gender and energy uh, policy. Um, I'm recently uh, finished my uh, PhD thesis with Joy Clancy as my supervisor, uh, about to defend it soon on gender just energy policy. And I'm presenting today a couple of my insights of my research. I have been working uh, as a policy advisor in municipalities. Uh, so I'm combining both my academic point of views uh, and research with my experience in, in practice. So when we're looking at uh, gender and energy policy, we're focusing today on what are the policy choices towards a just energy transition and how can policy making in energy transition involve a more gender just lens or can uh, have a more gender just outcome. So first of all, when looking at engendering policy and, and looking at the gender and energy nexus, there is lots to say about how many sustainable development, uh, how many SDGs are followed uh, the gender energy uh, nexus. What we see is that it's not only about the SDG 5 on gender equality, but it's also the SDG 7, of course, affordable and clean energy. But the gender and energy uh, nexus is touching upon several SDGs. What I would like to emphasize is that the SDGs is not a global south commitment. It's a global commitment um, asking for a national implementation 
both in the global north and the global south, which, uh, which would reflect local actions and implementation too. So in that sense, no, it's this mutual collaboration among and between the different SDGs and with both a northern and southern perspective. The SDGs are um, originated and part of a longer history of involving sustainability and gender approaches in policy choices. When we take an historical approach in how different gender approaches are included in the policy discourses, we can recognize from the 1970s a more women empowerment focusing on women only approaches, which is for uh, which is comes in, in around in the preparation and the aftermath of the uh, first women conference in, in Mexico. Uh, if we after the 1970s and the 1980s, there became more gender mainstreaming in the policy discourses. Um, it was we were looking at men and women in 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 collaboration, and the introduction of transformative approaches was also part of this uh, discourse on gender mainstreaming around uh, the Women Conference in Beijing. Towards the well, this century, uh, with the Millennium Goals uh, and also at the European Union, for example, we see this emerging of the social inclusion paragraph uh, and the social inclusion discourses in uh, policy uh, and conventions and international policy commitments. From the 2000s, Tense, we, we see a movement towards more the intersectional approaches, not only considering men and women as, 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 as a binary, but acknowledge that not all women are the same and not, not all men are the same, and that also social, other social elements like diversity, um, ethical backgrounds, um, age, etc are elements that need to be taken into consideration while taking a gender approach in policy design and policy implementation. And more recently, we see, well, we can identify the social justice approach. Uh, for example, the Black Lives Matters movement is part of this social justice approach. Well, uh, recognizing or identifying these three main engendering policy approaches, um, I have to say that in current policy making and, and in currency policy uh, analysis, we see all these different approaches uh, emerging and, and coexisting uh, and sometimes also Di well, a bit diluting, uh, diluted in, in, in different terminology and the different uh, policy discourses on uh, gender and uh, energy, but also on gender and other policy areas. But let's focus a bit more on this gender and energy uh, nexus and, uh, and what can we learn from the global south? Because as Joy already mentioned, all of us, or at least not uh, <laughs> the people are participating in, in the use of TCP and, and, and uh, working on this, this, this topic within uh, our collaboration within the use of TCP, have a background in uh, research in the global south. And the gender analyses are often developed based on research and empirical data uh, in the global south. And I believe that there are strong lessons to be learned from the Global South on uh, how gender is implemented in energy projects and energy policy. What we learn from the Global South is that not take sex dis disaggregation of data as your starting point no? and then go beyond this binary uh, like the picture demonstrates it, it all not all women are the same now we've got this big mix of, of social political economic and cultural backgrounds. So there are more social characteristics that in that has an impact on how we can um, access energy sources, how we can implement them, 
what are our needs and, and how are the uses. And that's not only for, for, for women, it's the same for men. So this take this intersectionality approach, but um, please don't take the household as one entity, as a homogeneous entity. The household's uh, compositions are complex and are fluid. And this is not only a phenomenon we see in the global South, but also in the global North. Huh? And if we look at how many, um, how many uh, women and men are living alone, for example, in the global north, uh, but they're all considered a household, but they might have a different energy consumption and a different energy needs than a household that composites with you know, multiple people and with, with dependent children, for example. So this, this um, fluidity and complex entity, the household, needs to be further studied for appropriate research and, and, and to have developed policy interventions that would reflect the needs uh, of the energy end user. From the global south, when we're talking about gender and energy, um, we see many energy interventions uh, focusing on improved cookstoves. And well, we know that having access to uh, clean and sustainable energy sources for cooking is uh, not only a question of sustainability and, ener and energy efficiency, but, but also from health. And so there are multiple, multiple elements that are included in this uh, improved cook stove debate and several policy uh, goals are, um, are, are reflected in, in improved cook stoves in the improved cookstoves debate. However, as we will see in the global north, uh, this, this element of energy efficiency, but also improved uh, health and sustainability is a combination that we can uh, base on previous experiences in the global south. Another element is that the decision-making power is not only lying with the senior male household member, but still, no, the senior male household member is often targeted in energy interventions for the uptake of domestic energy technology. Um, and, well, we should uh, challenge ourselves and challenge the policymakers to know more and to dive deeper into intra-household decision making and uh, what are how are the needs and uses reflected in the decision making uh, procedures of a household taking this this elements and these these lessons learned from global south to the global north we see uh, two main issues that are dominating and first of all it's as Joy already mentioned, is uh, how many the diversity in the, in, in the working uh, force in uh, in the energy sector, and how many women are working in the energy sector, and that is still definitely lagging behind a lot. You know, the, the the participation of women in the energy sector is is very limited. Although in the renewable energy sector we see a slightly better perspective, but it's still very strongly male dominated, which as a consequence, ask a lot of empathy from the decision makers and the policy makers in the energy sector to, to resonate with the needs uh, of the energy users that are more diverse than the people that are making the decisions. And the other issue is energy poverty. And energy poverty, uh, as we define as the, the, the inability to access those energy services that you need to have a comfortable living. Think about uh, heating or cooling and, and, and uh, hot water and, and cooking as well, is a severe issue in the global north and especially in Europe. When looking at energy poverty, we identify these three dimensions as uh, we already referred to in the Global South as well, when we're talking about the clean cooking debate. It's a social element, uh, the gender is a social compo uh, concept. It's talking about uh, the social role or the, the role, the masculine and feminine roles in society 
and the limitations and inequalities that re, uh, that are related to gender that has an impact on injustices in energy access that also has a has a response to the economic inequalities there are more women than men living in poverty hence the more uh, women than men living in energy poverty and you've got the biological the health component that makes women more um, more more uh, exposed to to for example indoor air quality when we're talking about using um, insufficient uh, and non-clean energy sources like wood fuel and um, especially in in the eastern european countries there is still a lot of use of uh, polluting firewood uh, for heating and cooking um, and that's not because uh, there is uh, well, not, not an alternative, but there is no affordable alternative and uh, renewable energy sources definitely need to be accessible for a, a huge variety of uh, groups in society. When talking about, and we already touched upon it in the discussion uh, that Joy started on, on uh, the looking at men and women working in the energy system, that's the producer role of actors in the energy system. Now we see women are underrepresented and also girls studying uh, science and technology and, and, and uh, is, is, is definitely uh, an, an ongoing uh, inequality throughout the whole energy system. But from a consumer perspective or from a consumer role, we also see this, this differences in energy needs and uses as explained in the gender and energy nexus and the energy poverty debates. Third, and, and, and the third role is the decision-making, uh, the decision-maker role. No? So who is, make, who is in the power positions, both corporate and in the public sector to overcome uh, gender inequality to overcome injustices in the energy system and to ensure that there is uh, a more fair process in access to energy services. And there we see a very strong gender gap in stakeholder participation. When we look at the, well, the, the emerging actor, which is the energy communities and local energy initiatives or the prosumers, uh, we see all these, these three roles combined in the energy consumer. And even there, we see a very strong um, domination of, uh, of, of a very homogeneous group of uh, high educated uh, male uh, prosumers that are trying to make decisions for a wider group, uh, asking for a lot of well um, empathy and and and, ref and and resonation with the energy use of and the energy needs of the energy users um, that is more diverse than the decision makers. So how can we overcome these inequalities and injustices in? Uh, in energy policy design and the energy justice framework as a conceptual academic framework um, is used here as, as an evaluative and normative framework to um, have, have a look at the inequalities and injustices in the energy uh, system and how policy choices can reflect and, 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 and um, can change these inequalities and, and uh, injustices. So the energy justice framework is, uh, is based on three main tenets. It's what we call the recognitional, distributive, and procedural tenets. Now the recognitional has this element of who is ignored and who should be recognized and from a gender component. Now we, we need to integrate there the intersectionality of energy users and their needs, understanding that and acknowledging that men and women have different energy use, uh, energy use and have different energy needs according to that. When we move on to the distributive tenet, it's about where are these injustices and how can we solve them? 
And there it's this, this element of gender equality and gender equity in energy access. And I will give examples of later on. The procedural tenet is focusing on the process, on the governance element. So how fair is the process towards energy services? Which new processes are there to, to develop to ensure inclusive representation and acknowledgement of inclusive energy rights? While working on this gender just energy policy framework, um, we try to uh, take a very holistic approach, acknowledging this, this tri triple or quadruple role of actors in the energy system, both as consumers, consumers, producers, and decision makers. And that enhance uh, the different elements uh, that we can identify based on policy analysis uh, of existing energy policies in uh, the global north. This uh, research is basically focused on the global north in which we distill these elements. So there you see the different roles coming back, the participation and uh, the rights in the procedural energy justice. With these elements, we combine them with criteria that could be used as a way for policymakers and decision makers to, 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 to assess and to observe their policy choices and how they can become more gender, gender just and how they can acknowledge the differences between men and women and between different groups in society. When we look at the re recognitional gender energy justice, the main observation in, in policy choices is that you should acknowledge fundamentally that women and men have different roles, responsibilities, and decision-making powers over the energy uses. We recognize that women have a different need for access to clean energy sources and technology, especially because they're still they're the traditional role in, uh, in households being responsible for cooking, cleaning, and uh, spending more hours at home. Um, so having a need for uh, cooling in the hot summers or heating in the winters. And what we see is that, for example, energy efficiency um, inter policy interventions are, well, are, are not acknowledging the differences in access to financial sources. So if you are able to invest in energy efficiency, or if you're able to invest in solar PV, for example, in your house, then you get a tax reduction or a subsidy. But many uh, groups in society, and especially uh, many women uh, living in from a small pension or having um, a small income, are not able to invest in this uh, this this new uh, energy technologies so um, we we need different policy instruments that are are reflecting this inequality when we look at distributive gender energy justice we're looking at distribution of of power who is who is uh what is the division of uh of jobs and positions within the energy system and how can we uh, acknowledge and support more diversity in the energy sector and, um, and, and how can uh, the distribution of policy choices over the different policy levels, both national, regional and local, be better distributed. And from a procedural gender energy justice, we're focusing on, on processes, on energy planning processes, how to mainstream gender across all these energy planning processes, how to acknowledge the different uh, stakeholders within the energy sex, uh, system, and how can we create a supportive and an institutional framework in which policy can be created, implemented, and monitored. The overall observations and recommendations based on our ongoing research on uh, energy policy through a gender lens is the element of context and cultural dimension. 
each country is different. Each country has very specific country specific indicators and definitions. Uh, so we need to find a way to make that make our frameworks uh, responsive to the cultural and contextual factors, but also uh, well challenge them to make, to overcome gender inequalities and energy injustices. The causes and consequences of inequality and, and, and equity in the energy system um, is still lacking understanding. And to improve the understanding, we need to have more data. We need to have more disaggregated data collected in an in intersectional and inclusive way, uh, developing indicators so that we, we know better what where are the inequalities, where are the energy injustices, how to address them in policy choices and how to overcome them and what is the impact uh, of policy on uh, the different uh, groups in society. And to understand this, um, the, 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 the complexity of, of gender and energy, we uh, need to have more cross-sectoral coordination going beyond different policy areas, uh, recognizing that we need um, the collaboration, not only from social welfare policy, but also from the energy transition uh, um, uh, policy departments to, to create legislation and, 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 implement, and support implementation with the institutional framework that goes beyond the different levels of governance, not only at the national level, but also at the local level um, to support the decentralization of energy transition at uh, the local uh, level, at the municipal level. So with that recommendations, I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward to discuss with you um, about this topic. <laughs>